All right, so today we are going to actually define a tensor. We are going to start with what we know, and we know that we have created a vector space V, and once we've created a vector space V, the dual space automatically comes with it. And I'm no longer going to, to do the whole thing with the V and the four dimensions and the real and the basis. I'm just going to, I'm just going to go with V. Uh, uh, we now know that all of those things are with a vector space, plus you have the notion of addition, you have the notion of scalar multiplication, and you have all of those things. We just have our vector space V and its dual. And now we are going to be create a t Cartesian product. Yes, we're going to create our first cart use relevant Cartesian product. We're going to take the Cartesian product of V with itself. And the Cartesian product of V with itself is a set of all ordered pairs with a vector from V and another vector from V. Both of these, both of these vectors here come from V because we have the first slot is V and the second slot is V. These didn't have to be, by the way, different sets. Obviously, we're going to make a Cartesian product of two sets. It's basically a, set, a pair, an ordered pair of vectors, and we call them vectors because they're from V. So this Cartesian product is the set of all possible pairs. Now, what I'm interested in, and this is sort of the critical thing, I'm interested in maps. We're always interested in maps in this business. I'm interested in a map that takes the, car the Cartesian product of the vector space and returns a real number. I'm interested in those maps. And those maps, those maps are tensors. That's right. A tensor is a map. And it's a map that takes elements from a Cartesian product of vectors, spaces, and returns a real number. That's really all it is. And we are going to now learn how to define that map. Now, I'm, I'm being a little bit coy because tensors come in many forms, and that's because there are many ways of making these Cartesian product. But for right now, let's just consider a Cartesian product of two vectors, and we're going to go and get a real number. Oh, and uh, one other thing. This set here is not necessarily a vector space. Just because this is a vector space and this is a vector space, we have to define, with for this, we would have to define an addition property, a scalar multiplication property, and other things to make this into a vector space. Now, we can do that, and that process is very typically done, and it's done through an operation called the direct sum. But we're not going to talk about that right now. We don't need to worry about it. All we need to worry about is getting this getting this mapping constructed. Turns out, we could, just like any mapping, we can do whatever we want. We could take this and say, you know, we, we could come up with any kind of rule that would take these vectors and produce a real number. But any kind of rule isn't good enough because what we want is something that does not extend beyond the creation of the vector, well, the creation of the vector space. We got the vector space, it gave us the dual automatically. This is all we want to create in the world. And so we, don't, we just want to use the tools that are at hand. And the tools that are at hand are pretty obvious. They are the maps living in the dual space. Somehow we're going to take the maps that are living in the dual space and use that to create this tensor map, which takes the Cartesian product space into the real numbers. And, and so... Let's first imagine, okay, we, there's, the other thing is, is that this mapping here, the, the mapping between the Cartesian product to the real numbers, this has to be a linear mapping. Those constraints that we don't want to add anything new and that we want a linear matting, mapping is going to force us into the following design. I'm going to take two covectors. The first one I'll call beta, and the second one I will call um, uh, alpha. I'll go reverse beta first then alpha second both of these since they're members of since they're members of the dual space they are maps that take vectors to the real numbers and the way we're going to construct this map is we're going to combine these things with an operation called the tensor product and we're going to create an object that looks like this and this object is this is a map this is a map this is the tensor product and this whole thing is the tensor product of beta and alpha. And 
the meaning of this tensor product is defined through the mapping that we're going to create. And this meaning comes in the following way. First of all, I'm going to put that map right here. Since it is a map, I'm going to write beta tensor product alpha. And notice, this thing stays as a unit. Beta tensor product alpha, this thing is the symbol for the tensor that we're dealing with. This tensor is going to make this mapping happen. And the way this make, makes the mapping happen is I will write down first what the map, the, the name of the map. Maybe put it in brackets just to make sure you track the fact that it's one object. And then uh, it's going to operate on two vectors. And since this is a since this is a map that takes two vectors, a pair, a, an ordered pair of vectors to the real numbers, this is going to be a real number. So what's the only real number in sight that keeps everything right, that makes this linear and only works with stuff in the, uh, in the dual space? And the answer is that we take the first map and we operate on the first vector and we multiply that real, that's a real number, right? And we multiply that by the second map operating on the second vector, right? And this product is the only way to preserve linearity, which we'll talk about in a moment. But th this is a now, this map, this tensor product is a map, and it's, it maps these ordered pairs into this particular real number product. And I just want you to understand, we have just defined a tensor, one type of tensor, and there are many more to come, but this is the most non-trivial tensor. Actually, what we also learned is that every member of the dual space is also a tensor because it's a map that takes uh, a Cartesian product of one to the real numbers, but that's sort of a degenerate simple tensor. We'll talk about it later. But this is the first really different kind of object. Would we? And this, this definition, the definition of this tensor product is nothing more than to show that this thing is a map that behaves in this way. There's nothing more to it. You can't take B and A and operate on it with this binary operation. It's, it's almost not even a binary operation. It's just a way to create a, a, a new thing. Now, you could, in principle, write, oh, let's write down um, uh, a super map and call it lambda, and lambda will be defined as beta tensor product alpha. Some, you could rename this thing if you wanted to, but then you have to kind of remember that this has two slots. You might confuse this with some, with a regular map, right? A map that only acts on, on one vector, right? How are you going to remember that this acts on two? If you leave it in this form, you always know. You always know that there's a, there's a covector, there's a covector, therefore this thing is a map that takes a pair of vectors and gives you a real number. And that's, um, that's what we've just done here. That's what's so important. So now, let me uh, move this aside for a moment. Oops. Um, and let's talk about uh, how you might, uh, how, what we might, uh, what properties we want this map to have. So first of all, I want to be able to just like I did with regular maps in the dual space, if I have a map beta tensor product alpha and I have another map gamma tensor product delta, say, and all of these are members of the dual space, so they all come from V star, beta, alpha, gamma, and delta come from the dual space, I want to be able to talk about adding these two maps together. <clears throat> just like I talked about adding uh, two, two um, uh, uh, regular um, uh, dual space vectors together. And the way the definition is going to work is, ex it's, since these, everything is linear, we want these things to be linear, I'm going to define this by saying, by saying that, um, uh, that beta cross alpha plus gamma tensor product delta, this, I want that to be a map, and I want it to operate on two vectors, v and w. And the way I want it to operate is in a perfectly linear fashion. I want it to be, what was that? I want it to be beta tensor product alpha v w plus 
gamma tensor product delta v w. And that, of course, is going to be beta v alpha w plus gamma v delta w, just like that. And if I throw, uh, if I throw a, um, a little a and a little b, two real numbers in there, that would fall down to here and to here and to here and to here, and that proves that it's linear. We've defined the sum, so it has an addition property, and we've uh, defined scalar multiplication by members of, real, of the real numbers. And therefore, the set of all tensor products, tensor products of two covectors, covectors, that set is a vector space. And this is going to be true for all tensors we make. Any tensor we make, uh, whether it's uh, a tensor product of, of uh, two, two um, covectors, three, four, five, it's always going to have this type of linearity, and it's always going to have these properties. So all tensor product spaces, that's what this is. This is a tensor product space, a TSP, or a TS. Tensor product spaces are vector spaces, and since the element of any vector space is a vector, all tensors are vectors, right? So that's kind of a funny way of looking at it, but that's what the, but the language is unambiguous. I'm not making a mistake there. All tensors are, in fact, vectors. And what's really important to understand is that they're vectors because you can add them, because they have a linearity property, and because they have... Um, uh, scalar multiplication, all those things uh, are equivalent and all tensors are vectors. Okay, so now that we've gotten that far, I'm going to erase this screen and we're kind of going to start fresh. We're going to take all of this mess that we've now created, this tensor product space, and we are going to get a little bit more formal. Okay, so now we're going to sort of refresh this and start from the beginning. Each time I like to start from the beginning again because it's a chance to review and to fill in gaps I may have missed. But what we're going to start with is a vector space which implies the existence of a dual space and now we know that this implies the existence of one type of tensor product space called V star dot V star. Now I'm using this tensor product symbol in a slightly different way. I'm using it with a set on both sides and this object here is meant to be the set of all possible uh, uh, sec uh, second rank tensors, all possible objects that look like B tensor product gamma, right? And it also is intended, because it's a tensor product space, it's also intended to imply the addition property that we described a moment ago and uh, the scalar multiplication property we described a moment ago, and it's a real vector space. And uh, all the properties, so this thing here is a vector space. This tensor product space is a vector space. And uh, it's called a rank two tensor product space, and we're going to uh, uh, describe why um, in the next section we're going to talk about other tensor product spaces, but for right now we're just building this one. So all of these things come into existence at the same time. <clears throat> Again, using this all possible principle, we presume that that doesn't mean any act of creation because we haven't actually pulled a special one out. A lot of general relativity is about pulling a special one out. We'll see later. So now that all these things exist, and we know that this is a, a, a vector space, we have to treat this exactly the way we treated these two things. And how did we do that? Well, in this thing, we knew that there was a basis. And in this thing, we created a basis. And that basis went through the definition. Uh, we, we, it was an arbitrary definition, but we chose it. And meaning that once we have selected this basis, it sort of automatically selects this basis, and it uses this rule. Well, what about this thing? This thing has to have a basis also. And this thing's basis is going to be a collection of of tensors because it's a tensor product space, it's filled of elements, and each element is a tensor. So what do the tensors that make the basis of this thing 
look like? What do those, those basis tensors look like? And it's going to be relatively obvious. The, one of them will be E0, tensor product E0, and another one will be E superscript 0, tensor product E superscript 1. Because remember, on the left side and the right side are covectors. Well, there's a covector. E0 is one covector. E0 is another covector. This object is uh, the tensor product of two covectors. In this case, the two covectors are the same. So that is clearly a tensor, and it is a map, and we'll show how that map works in a moment. Likewise, this is a uh, covector and a covector, and that's the tensor product of two covectors. And here, the tensor product symbol takes a covector and a covector and produces a tensor. Here, the tensor product symbol takes a set of covectors and a set of covectors and produces the set of all possible um, tensors. So this, uh, this symbol is a little overloaded, and the context of whether it's this whether this result is a vector space or this result is a single tensor is completely contextual. If you have two sets, you end up with a vector space, a tensor product space. If you have two particular covectors, you end up with a specific tensor. But let me continue, right? E0, tensor product E2, and E0, tensor product E3. And then you repeat this structure for E1. So you have E1, tensor product E0, E1, tensor product E1, E1, tensor product E2, and E1, tensor product E3. Okay, so you've got that thing. And then you do it for E2, tensor product E0, etc., and E3, tensor product E0, and then the last one is E3, tensor product E3, right? And each of these objects here, each of these things are maps because they're tensors, and tensors are maps, and specifically, tensor is a map from the Cartesian product of two copies of the vector space into the real numbers. So how would, say, let's pick one out. How would, say, this map work? Well, this map would work the following way. E1, let's see, tensor product E2, this tensor acting on an, uh, an arbitrary vector, which I'll write A mu E mu, and B nu E nu, right? So this is an ordered pair of arbitrary vectors using the arbitrary form. This is a tensor. It's a specific tensor. It's, the, it's one of the basis tensors of the tensor product space. So this map acts on these arbitrary vectors in a very specific way. And that way is going to be, as we've defined it, e, the mapping of E1 on A mu E mu multiplied by the mapping of E2 on B nu E nu. And this mapping here is simply A mu E1 E mu. And this mapping is B mu E2 E nu. And because of everything being linear. But we know what this is and we know what that is. This is delta 1 mu. And this is delta 2 nu. Which means this whole result is A 1, B, 2. That is a real number. And so we've just shown how that mapping works for arbitrary vectors. Um, as long as those vectors are written in the, the basis we've agreed on, oops, as long as those, uh, they're written in the basis we've agreed on, the answer is going to be uh, a quite a simple product of the um, components. And that's why we choose this basis. That's why we choose this, because it makes these calculations easy. But it is arbitrary. There's still, like I said, no correspondence between vectors here and vectors here just because we've assigned this basis. So that is how we uh, execute these basis maps. But we still have one other thing we have to do, which is we have to, uh, we, we assign bases for all of our vector spaces, and we had a way of writing an arbitrary vector, right? We had a right way of writing a mu e mu for an arbitrary vector, and we, we were able to write, say, um, uh, b nu e nu for an arbitrary covector. How do we write an arbitrary tensor? Now we have 16 bases. We can't just use a symbol like this. What we have to do is something uh, a little bit different. So I'm going to... Um,
uh, let me uh, let me take all of this, shrink it, and move it aside and start. So now our question is: We want to write, uh, given this tensor product space, right? The whole tensor product space, which is a vector space, we want to write an arbitrary tensor in this thing. And what do we have? Well, we have the basis. We have the basis E mu tensor product E nu. So we've assigned the basis. So now we have to assign um, a way of writing the arbitrary vector, uh, arbitrary tensor. So I want to be able to write, what is up with this line? I've got to figure that out. Um, we've got to write, um, uh, say, an arbitrary tensor in this space is B tensor product gamma. I'm going to say that that has to be composed of basis vectors that are written in this form, right? So mu runs from 0, 1, 2, and 3, and nu runs from 0, 1, 2, and 3. So this symbol here, this symbol here kind of encapsulates every possible basis vector, of which there are 16, right? So that is one interesting thing, is the tensor product space now has dimensionality 16. It's 16 dimensional. So, uh, but in order to get this to be, but this guy here has to be a linear sum of these. So we invoke the Einstein summation convention, but we need an object that has two indices out in front. We need to create an object with two indices. These are just still a bunch of real numbers. But it's two indices out in real front, and each one is summed in the Einstein convention because you have a lower indice that matches with an upper and a lower that matches with the upper. And when you expand that sum, you get T00, E0, tensor product E1, plus T01, E0, tensor product E1. Remember, this is a basis vector, this is a basis vector, this is a real number, this is a real number. And it goes plus T, 0, 2, E, 0, tensor product E, 2, plus T, 0, 3, E, 0, tensor product E, 3, plus etc., etc., until you finally end up with plus T, dot, 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 T, um, 3, 2, E, 3, tensor product E, 2, plus T, 3, 3, E, 3 tensor product E3, like that. And we know everything we need to know now. We know how these maps work, right? We know that these are real number coefficients. And now we've discovered uh, a, a, a collection of real numbers that actually requires two indices. And the Einstein sum uh, attaches each of these real numbers to a specific basis vector. And yes, this is the rank 2 tensor you see in general relativity. We're, and we're going to see this tensor often and many, many others. Uh, uh, what, but now you understand what these things are when you see them. They are the coefficients of tensors, which are vectors, and they are the coefficients of the basis vectors of the tensor product space. And because all tensors are vectors, now we can start sorting through and getting straight how all this language works. Okay, so in our next lecture, we're going to um, flush this out a little bit more. We're going to learn about building bigger tensor product spaces. And um, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, uh, how these tensors operate. But you've pretty much got it all down. Tensors are maps. They're maps that take elements from the Cartesian product space of vectors into real numbers. You can look at them as, as a device A tensor product B um, is a map that uh, operates on a pair of vectors to give you a real number. Or you can think of it as an operator that has two slots and you have to insert a vector in the first slot and a vector in the second slot. And they're vectors, right? You're not, it's not a vector and a covector, it's of two vectors is what these things gobble up. Um, assuming that these two things are elements of the dual space, right? And um, we're going to talk about generalizing this concept in, in the next lecture.